this isn't going to be slides, lecture. It's us all talking together and talking with our colleagues who are joining us um, on the Zoom meeting. So um, we want to use this time to, to get an understanding and, and reaffirm kind of where are we at in this whole perspective of establishing some standards for care. I think that consistently, wherever I meet um, patients, patient groups, the issue of having access to timely good care is you know, prime it is such a important topic. And so often people share, unfortunately, many of us have heard stories of delay in diagnosis or not getting to the right center and how, um, how important that is. Um, <coughs> this isn't a new problem though. And I think we've thought about this for a very long time. I'm sharing with you a, it's a sarcoma progress review group report that was done by the National Cancer Institute in the United States. And they convened this group in 2004. <laughs> and um, there, there are three pages of, of people who uh, participated in this, but I wanted to point out that they had included um, Dr. Mark Thornton, who was the founder of the Sarcoma Foundation of America. So he was a voice of patient, so even in 2004. So, so we've been still, we've been, we've been working at this. And also Norm Scherzer was from the Life Raft Group was part of this convening of experts saying, the, the, the National Cancer Institute would periodically bring together groups of experts, and so this included multidisciplinary, pathology, radiology, <laughs> orthopedic, medical, pediatric, a really group of kind of who's who uh, in sarcoma to say, how do we make progress in these rare diseases? So it's not new that we've been asking this question. And when you look at one of their comments, you know, they had, it's, a, it's quite a booklet, and I'm happy to share with you at some point in time, but. It just points out that we, at that time and still today, there's lack of uniform standard of care, difficulty in diagnosis, lack of new treatments at the time, and Matnib has out, so I'm sure Norm's, Norm put that statement in there, except for GIST. Um, and it, um, most sarcoma patients have really been underserved by the medical and research communities. And so that is in 2004. So now if we go to 2022, and one of the standards in the United States that's used quite commonly is the National Comprehensive Cancer S Network guidelines. And in the soft tissue sarcoma guidelines, again, it's a group of experts within the field of sarcoma in the United States gathered together to look at what is the evidence from the research. Based on the evidence, they weigh it and say, what are our recommendations for treating and managing people who have sarcoma? And they have one for bone tumors, and then they have one for soft tissue. But I point out that within these guidelines, they do say, and these were just updated May of 2022, so they try to keep this very relevant. Every time there's a new publication, they convene the group and say, should we be changing our guidelines? But they say, prior to initiation of treatment, all patients should be evaluated and managed by a multidisciplinary team with extensive expertise and experience. Because it's rare and complex, evidence-based recommendations need to be followed. Then they point out when they look at the patients that um, have been treated in the National Cancer Database showed that if you adhere to guidelines, people will have improved survival. So it's stated in many, and, and, and I'm just pointing from the perspective I recognize from the US, but today we're gonna talk and hear from all of you and see, but what does this mean? How does this look? How do we get patients to those centers? Uh, and how do we make sure that it happens? So we've recognized for many years that this is important. In 2004, that publication, 2022, but still people aren't getting to center, still people are not. And so I, you know, my understanding in my, in my new, newly coming to span that this is an opportunity internationally for us to say, how do we move this forward? How do we change this? This is really an opportunity to use the powerful patient voice to do that. Just to set the scene for discussion, you know, we want to think a little bit about what are the priorities from a perspective of patient and patient advocates regarding excellence in sarcoma care. What is most important to us from a perspective of the patient? From um, when we look at the current sta uh, status of establishing guidelines, I think there's a spectrum across the world 
you know, some places have no access to expertise or have to travel to another country to get expertise, whereas others have set up some guidelines in their certifying centers. So how do we learn from each other and we capture today where we stand with that? And where are the opportunities to uh, collaborate and es establish at least some minimal standards to incorporate the priorities of the patient and patient advocate? Is it establishing centers of excellence? Is it networks? Is it a combination? Is it not one size fits all, but we look at where are the strengths and weaknesses, and then people think about their own area, geography, the limitations, whether it be um, from medical systems, how they're established, insurance, and payers. And really our goal today is to, to work at as a gr group, understand the landscape where we stand in 2022. I recognize we've talked about this for a long time, so it's not new, this is not a new topic. But what we want to do is say where we are today, what is the status across the world? How do we use that information then to create a roadmap that we can develop and implement, not just develop, but implement? I think that's the, I should have actually put that all in caps, you know, like shouted that. How do we, how do we actually implement the standards around the world so that all patients with sarcoma have access to excellent care? I think that is absolutely critical because we know that best outcomes for, for patients are gonna be when they have excellent care. So with that as a, just a way of setting the stage, I'd like to turn to that we pull up the, the, uh, the pictures of our, our online colleagues so that we can see who's online and then begin a discussion like we're, we're kind of all in one room, even though we're gonna make the best of, of the distance. Um, and so we hope to capture this and then really put this into initiative. And Marcus, correct me if I'm wrong, so that we can really take this on as a project as SPAN and not have it be that we are talking 12 years from now, oh, let me show you the document we created and we still didn't implement. So you can take the slides away, um, we, that's fine. And, and it was just meant as kind of a kind of food for thought and help kind of frame where we're, we're headed. And I might ask if there's someone online that would like to kind of begin and launch off the discussion of where are things at within your region, your country? Um, and, and we'd love to hear and, and have you hear uh, your perspective. Who will bravely jump in? Uh, okay, I, I see my picture on the screen. So. <laughs> We hear you, and, and it's nice to feel you in the room with us. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a SL um, arts nurse, so I'm coming from France. And uh, maybe some of you already know that we have the chance to have uh, centers of uh, excellence uh, on sarcomas in France. Um, it's been established uh, since uh, uh, 2010. And uh, we, it, it was uh, done in the frame of a national uh, politics, uh, which uh, aimed at uh, developing uh, specific uh, networks of excellence in uh, uh, 19 uh, rare types of cancers, uh, including sarcoma. So this is uh, how um, we came to develop centers of reference for sarcomas. Uh, the aim of uh, this uh, structuration was, of course, to allow patients with rare cancers to reach optimal uh, management and access to treatment. And, uh, of course, uh, one of the, um, the first objective of, uh, was to uh, increase uh, the visibility of the expert medical teams, because as you um, uh, said at the beginning, uh, one of the major difficulties patients are facing at the beginning is to identify the right doctors and the right centers to be treated. So this was uh, the very first objective of uh, the, this uh, national structuration. Uh, the second point was also to organize a regional coverage of uh, uh, these expert centers, because it is sometimes difficult when you live in a country um, or uh, in, in a small region to identify uh, where these uh, teams are. So um, they were asked to uh, establish a national map uh, with the equal uh, regional coverage of these medical centers. 
but uh, the, the, the thing was not only to um, organize the clinical management, uh, because uh, as you know, uh, one of the major issue in sarcoma uh, is also the, also concerns the diagnosis process. And uh, they were also asked to ensure uh, access to second pathological review uh, for all suspected cases of sarcomas. So it means that uh, since two uh, 2010, uh, when uh, one sarcoma case is suspected, it has to be reviewed by a pathological uh, platform specifically dedicated to sarcoma. And of course, uh, it was also uh, to facilitate rapid access to rare cancer multidisciplinary teams, because as you said, it is highly crucial in, this man in the management of these tumors. So uh, following this, um, the Sarcoma Network of Excellence uh, was developed in 2010 and comprised three different networks. Uh, one pathological network for sub-tissue sarcoma. It only... Uh, uh, comprise uh, pathologists. Another network which is specific to soft tissue sarcoma, and this network uh, is called NETSARC. NETSARC. And another uh, network for bone sarcomas, uh, which comprised pathologists and clinicians. Uh, and uh, since 2019, uh, these three networks have now merged into a single one called NETSARC Plus. And this organization comprises one multicentric national center, which uh, involves uh, Saint Léon Béra Réunion, Institut Bergogne in Bordeaux, and uh, Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris. They are considered as the national centers of reference. And uh, around them, we also have 22 uh, regional centers. Uh, each of them uh, hosting a, spe a specialist sarcoma uh, multidisciplinary team. And all of these regional centers have to be connected with a specific sarcoma pathological platform. So this is how uh, the, the French uh, sarcoma uh, network uh, is organized uh, in France for the moment. Uh, yesterday, uh, I read a, a report uh, which had been delivered by the National Cancer Institute uh, following the implementation of these networks. And um, the thing is, we, we could observe that uh, uh, the Sarcoma uh, Network uh, of Excellence uh, was one of the most, maybe the most dynamic uh, network in France. Uh, among the 19 uh, networks who were developed. Uh, it um, allowed to increase uh, the number of patients uh, which were managed uh, in um, sarcoma expert centers. In three years, we had more than uh, three quarters of the um, diagnosed patients uh, which had been managed in specific sarcoma centers. So it was a very important improvement in terms of access to expertise for patients. Uh, the number of uh, delayed and wrong diagnosis had also been uh, uh, significantly uh, decreased by the creation of uh, this pathological platform, which uh, obliged all the, the, uh, the medical centers to uh, ask for a second review um, of the tissue samples when uh, the um, diagnosis of sarcoma is suspected. Um, one uh, one uh, aspect was also interesting. Um, it was the number of uh, clinical trials which have been developed through this network because one of the mission, uh, uh, one of the missions of these networks is also to develop um, clinical and translational research, but also to improve uh, patient participation in clinical trials. And uh, surprisingly, well, I already know that this network was very dynamic, but we were very, very far <laughs> uh, before the other uh, networks uh, dedicated to other rare cancers, because uh, if I can give you an example, uh, the number of uh, academic trials, uh, we had 
nearly uh, in three years, nearly 100 trials, uh, uh, sorry, 50 trials uh, developed and uh, the number of patients was uh, beyond the charts which were recruited in the uh, trials. So that was uh, very impressive to see. And uh, also the establishment of, um, the establishment of a database on a national level allowed to register uh, almost 20,000 patients in the national registry in less than three years. So it showed um, the, the relevance of this kind of structuration because uh, now uh, sarcoma centers have to um, concentrate uh, their, their data in the same uh, registry. So it allows to have a better uh, global uh, view of the situations in France regarding the diagnosis and the right management of sarcomas on, uh, on the national level. I hope I was clear. I'm sorry about my English. I, I speak English for a long time. <laughs> no, that, that was excellent and very clear. Do, it, is it something for all of us to ascribe to? I mean, that is like, that, that sets a bar quite high of, of, you know, how it's excellent to know there's a good example. Um, can we, can, do we have extra microphones to move about so people can, um, because uh, I'd like this really to be conversational and, and people to uh, engage and, and ask some questions. How, did, how do you um, evaluate or continue to evaluate the centers? You know, because no. sometimes people change and, and so it's one thing to get it established and then it's another matter to ensure that it remains. This is, a, this is actually uh, what has been pointed uh, in the conclusion of the, uh, this report as one of the weaknesses. <laughs> Uh, because um, the uh, evaluation is organized as such, you have an uh, internal uh, evaluation which is performed by the network itself. So you can imagine how difficult it can be to evaluate your own centers. And uh, because uh, the risk is to lose the label uh, for some regional centers uh, who might uh, lost uh, one, of, one or several of their uh, physicians. And uh, the second aspect of this evaluation is an external evaluation. So, and in the end, uh, they have to find, uh, let's say, a consensus <laughs> about uh, who should remain in the network and who should leave. And it is clear that sometimes for political reasons, um, some centers uh, are still considered as uh, sarcoma reference centers where I, whereas they should not be because uh, maybe the surgeon has, has left, for instance, or uh, the, the, the main uh, oncologist has left. So it is really difficult to have um, a, a clear uh, view of the situation in certain regions. But however, um, this can be um, over, uh, sorry, uh, the, the fact that they have um, connections with the three reference centers can help to uh, equilibrate the, the, to find the right balance between uh, the loss of expertise on one side and the fact that they still have connections with the uh, three most important uh, national centers. Because you, you, you can ask, you can submit your cases to these centers to uh, finally have uh, uh, therapeutic decisions, uh, which is delivered by experts anyway. Yeah, that can be very, very difficult, but but sounds like you're tackling that. One last quick question before I, I, I share the microphone with the others is, is what was the involvement of, of patient advocacy and patient voice in establishing this? Did, did, you, did patient advocates have a role and were they um, listened to and their opinion valued? Yeah, uh, indeed, uh, uh, I was um, the starting point of this national project because uh, I, I started sitting um, in this uh, National Cancer uh, Commission at the National Cancer Institute. And I pointed the fact that it was very difficult for, so for sarcoma patients to identify the right centers. So I was involved in, the, in this uh, national project uh, at the very beginning. And of course, it facilitates the connection with the sarcoma expert teams, uh, which was also asking for this kind of structuration. 
So uh, fortunately, we could collaborate on this project uh, very closely from the beginning. And uh, we are still uh, involved in the um, uh, uh, French ACOMA network commissions. Uh, we are still closely collaborate, uh, collaborating with experts. So we have the chance uh, to, to work together on, on this uh, issue. Um, however, we still have uh, uh, topics of disagreement, notably regarding the uh, evaluation of some centers, because as patients, we know that there are places where uh, maybe uh, one <laughs> patient should not go because of this lack of expertise. Uh, and uh, we notably uh, ask for a better evaluation regarding surgeries because we have self-appointed um, sarcoma surgeons uh, experts, which are clearly not sarcoma experts. And uh, so th this is a big discussion we, um, we often have uh, with the French sarcoma group because I think uh, uh, surgery is really a key issue uh, in the survival and quality of life outcomes of the patients, but this is still a critical point um, from the medical <laughs> level because uh, they do not want to exclude people. But I also share this opinion. The fact uh, is not to exclude people, but maybe to uh, offer them a better training in order to avoid wrong surgery, because these people are convinced they are doing well. And the problem <laughs> comes from the fact that no, nobody tells them they are doing wrong. Uh, but for legal reason, it's, uh, it seems to be even complicated to tell them that they have done wrong. So we have uh, bad surgeons uh, who are still um, operating uh, patients uh, doing wrong, thinking they are doing well. <laughs> uh, so so the, the, this is a really um, uh, a key issue we are uh, still discussing with them because uh, I think something needs to be done uh, on this level. But, but at least you have a voice. I think that that's what's really important is that you continue to have the discussion and that you're able you know, I know some situations where uh, patients would not be able to even express that, to say, we, we think somebody isn't the expert that they think they are, and we're not getting the care that we want to have. So mm -hmm. at least it opens the door for very difficult conversations. Those are not easy discussions, I don't think, to have. So uh, thank you so much, Estelle. That was just mm -hmm. such, such excellent insight. Uh, please uh, thank you, uh, Estelle. It's a very interesting uh, story that you told us. Um, uh, and uh, I think also what you mentioned about um, the, let's say, the collaboration or the evaluation on the on the level of the of the medical professionals themselves is very well is recognizable. I think we see that in many places. Uh, it's difficult to have a mechanism among the professionals to, to correct each other, you know, and to, and to say, well, we don't think you are really expert. But in this respect, I think an important point is, is there an, a question, um, and I guess, well, maybe I guess the answer, but um, is there a central organization for the network? And is there also a budget to, to to really um, enable sharing of experience, coming together, learning from each other, et cetera. Because uh, I, I think often that is a key issue, that there is no money and therefore no time available to, to collaborate. Yes, yes, there, there is a long list of recommendations that have been uh, pre-established by the National Cancer Institute. And uh, in exchange of uh, the respect of this recommendation, of course, there is a quite a significant budget which is allocated to the development and the uh, organization of this network. Uh, in in uh, 2010, it was among uh, uh, for um, around four hundred thousand dollars or something like uh, euros or something like this. So it, it was quite significant to uh, help in the organization of this network. That was your question. Did I answer right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Good morning, Andrea, Orchestra per la Vita Italy. Uh, I have a question for the audience. Um, do you know Huracan Network? Um, are you aware of any patient who had the opportunity to use Huracan? That's a question for the audience. I've been involved in Uracan from a very early beginning, also in the field of sarcomas. And the main issue with Uracan is that uh, all these uh, so-called ERNs, European Reference Networks, they really, from the very early beginning, have no financial support. They have just the minimum financial support to set up this network. And Estelle is, knowing, uh, is exactly known what I'm telling about because her uh, colleague, medical colleague Jean-Yves Blay is the driver of Huracan mm -hmm. and Huracan is making some progress during the last years but is still challenging. They set up something like an internal, um, I would call it IT system to put in patients into the system uh, to bring in uh, the, the, the data and the information of the, of, of the patient into the system and then to discuss these cases within the system and get, get recommendations uh, within the system. The main problem is the practicability of this, of this system in the moment. Um, I think we made a, a result, I think two years ago, and there had been three or four sarcoma uh, pa patients discussed within the system uh, two or three years ago. The main problem is if there are sarcoma cases that can be not managed uh, within a single system, normally the experts would call their national colleagues and then discuss this with on a national level, or they would call maybe, Peter Reichert would call Jean-Yves and discuss this directly instead of putting all the data into such a system. That's the complexity of the system. It's not easy. I think that that's the challenge in the moment. Um, I think there is more, let's call it, maybe there is some value in the future if we have centers, for example, in Eastern Europe, where we don't have uh, the, the quality or where we don't have uh, centers of excellence to put patients into a system and get some support. The main problem is that this system has no funding at the moment. That means um, all the experts within the system, maybe Jean-Yves and Peter and all these guys who are involved in this, they get no money for their work doing within the system and that costs them a lot of additional workload. So for example, if you would put maybe, let's think about uh, 200, 300 patients from Eastern Europe into the system and then the centers who are involved in the system should take time to discuss these, these, these cases and help other patients or help other centers to discuss these cases. There is no, no money, there is no, no background in the system. That's one of the major problems of the system. That was our understanding so far. Mm. Okay, fine. No, because <laughs> I know that I'm a little bit unpolite and rude sometimes, but we have spent more than uh, 1 million euros more than 1 million euros for this Huracan net. And it's a pity we can't use it. Now, uh, my daughter is treated at Milan Hospital, which is not a so small hospital. I live very far from uh, Milan. And uh, every time I have to perform these scans, and then I have to send these scans, a lot of bytes, via a commercial platform, which is unbelievable. So I'm sending in plain text the data to a hospital. It's unbelievable. Yeah, maybe I can, I can chime in from a Dutch perspective because I think we, um, and maybe uh, Gerard, uh, if you want to uh, address this topic as well, because I, I recognize your, um, uh, your remarks on the costs for people if there are centrali centralized centers of excellence or reference centers or however you want to call them. Um, we've been in quite some uh, procedure with both the government and the hospitals in the Netherlands. Um, can, I, can I tell you something about it and then chime in on your uh, question about the costs for um, or the difficulties for having uh, um, only a few hospitals, is that okay? 
Maybe just to finish your just to finish your question, we we are really close uh, to to Eurocon, and we are really looking forward what's going on there in the in in the, in the network and all the patient advocates uh, who are really involved in Eurocon, and we are not talking about sarcomas that we we are talking about all the different other rare cancers that are placed in 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 in, in Eurocon. We are really. I would not so say skeptical, but we are really critical about what's going on there, and we 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 really try to influence this, and we also put our our um, fingers into the wound and ask for some issues. Um, and the main issue from a European perspective is that it's great to set up all these networks, 24 networks, but then if there is no sufficient funding to run these networks on a, on a, on a high level, that's the main issue. And this is also what, what um, Gerard just mentioned with some of the national networks. If you don't have any money in place, if you don't have any infrastructure in place, it's quite very challenging to do this. But we keep everyone updated about this, what, what's the developing going on there. But wouldn't you agree that Eurocan, yes or no, it's, it's an excellent uh, structure, but you still need a national structure in place as well. It should be a combination. You can't hear me? No. Okay, my mic isn't working, I'll type. A bit better. That's a bit better. Please speak. And oh, um, would you agree, Marcus, that um, Eurocan is is an important structure, but you would still need a national structure in place? Absolutely. Eurocan is a network of networks, so that means you have to have on the long term. You need to have national networks, and then Eurocan might work. Uh, but there is a long way to go to do it. And I know that also people like Jean-Yves and others, they, they really have a hard time in driving things forward with this. I think it's important that we start capturing too some of the challenges. So there are, there are um, we're not gonna solve the problems, but I think as we look at how do we go forward, what are some of the networks that are in place? What are some of the challenges that they've posed? And then how do we make sure we try to, how do we kind of overcome those obstacles? And just to mention, Eurocon is not only a sarcoma network, it's for rare adult cancers. That means we have 10 different domains. That means sarcomas is only one domain, and then we have head and neck, neuroendocrine tumors, and different other areas. So this is a big network, and it, 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 this big network lives more or less from the engagement of the of the sub networks and, and and different people who drive this forward, but funding is a huge issue, definitely. Caroline, you were going to tell us a bit about the the Dutch system. Yeah, um, if anybody, I'll I'll put out my my video if nobody minds because. I have to be so close to the mic. <laughs> um, we've been working on this for a couple of years now. Um, uh, the sarcoma net, uh, um, we have centers of export centers, we call it, and they're um, appointed by the government. So hospitals can apply for the status. And if they get a status, they get a stamp from the, from the Ministry of Health. And then they can call themselves expert centers and can be included in the ERN uh, organization. Um, the appointment is for a period of five years. It's really a strict procedure. Um, we have had it in place for six years now and had a, um, a, a new procedure. So every five years, the hospitals need to apply new and provide all the information. So we have a five year check um, and that works kind of okay, I must say. Um, from the patient perspective, we worked with um, uh, getting a, um, how do you say, an, an inventory of the sarcoma care in the Netherlands that we did that in 2020. Then in 2021, there was the procedure of getting um, the the, the uh, expert centers. Uh, oh, my English is early. Um, the, the procedures of getting the status for the expert centers um, uh, acknowledged. And this year we're working towards 
networks around the expertise centers. So we're trying to well spread the oil uh, uh, around in in the uh, in the Netherlands, um, and I think that's that's quite a, a good uh, few steps we can take for getting the best uh, uh, care for the for the sarcoma patients. And money is an issue because I think a lot of the work that the professional should be doing are we doing as a patient organization. Um, and we have some funding for um, looking into the export centers, but funding indeed is, is a problem. Uh, what's another problem is that the soft tissue sarcomas are the part that's uh, more difficult than the bone sarcomas. The bone sarcomas are going to the right centers for 87%, so that's good. For the soft tissue, it's about 60%, so that's not so good. Um, and we're working on some kind of, well, we call it a traffic light. Um, our idea is that every patient should be assessed in an expert center. Um, not everybody should be treated because you don't have the, the people to, uh, the, the experts for treatment. Um, so the traffic light would make a difference between the diseases who are a must to be treated in an expert centers. The yellows are, well, maybe yes, maybe no, but the person should be seen in an expert center. And uh, green is probably not that uh, uh, very difficult. So um, a digi digital assessment would be uh, sufficient. Um, I think it will work. It's not there yet, but we're, yeah, we're getting there. I don't know if Gerard has something to add. No, I think you made um, uh, you made this quite clear. Um, of course, there are a number of difficulties um, in this in in the whole system. Um, well, what I asked earlier uh, to Estelle is also a, a matter of uh, is also a problem in the Netherlands. I think um, we want to see more interaction between centers and. Um, local uh, or, or let's say the uh, non-center hospitals who are also doing sarcomas but connected to center of excellence in a network um, and this should be not too um, how do you say um, the, the the collaboration m should be a must so there must be a mechanism to correct if it's not working correctly and that's not still there. That's still not there. Um, but as you mentioned um, very rightly, um, there's not enough capacity to to bring all the sarcoma cases to the centers. So the more difficult cases should be treated in the in the centers. That is that is your red uh, light. Um, then uh, the, the 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 orange light is that. It's, it's not really necessary to treat it uh, to, to do, for instance, surgery in the, in the expert center, but the patient must be seen once and, meant, and discussed in a uh, multidisciplinary uh, team at the center, and then an advice can be given to the network, um, hospital, how to do the treatment. But mm -hmm. for these actions, in the in the Dutch system, there is not yet um, a, a, a mechanism for compensation. Uh, so this is um, one of the things that has, have have to be changed. Um, and also, um, well, that was also mentioned by Estelle in France. If um, if a hospital is not delivering the quality that they should deliver, there is no good mechanism to correct. And, um, what's happening? <laughs> there is one mic. <laughs> oh, okay, open. That should not be open, I think. But it's it's okay. Um, so I think. We need still some development in the, in the whole system, um, and um, 
Also, I think um, a point to, to recognize is that in a network um, is in S well is is a network of organizations. You have an expert center um, for sarcoma, and it, then you have the network around it. So that's an organization, but in the end it comes down to a network of people and the colleagues must be really working together and sharing experience, correcting uh, each other if necessary. Um, and, and also we have to record, we have, we should not forget that part of this network is also the patient. And um, we have to also look at the, the perspective of the patient. The patient um, is ill, wants to be, have need treatment, treatment, and how does a patient deal with um, multidisciplinary network? Uh, they are, th th we also have to take care that there is, uh, for most patients, they need, they want one person they can talk to. This is my problem. What is going to happen? So I think we. This is this is um, an aspect I think that is also in particular a task for us as patient uh, organizations uh, to take care that um, the case management is clear for every patient. Is this on? I hear a lot of common themes coming out about, you know, collaborations, establishing centers, and uh, Caroline, I have a, qu a quick question for you. I think that's something yeah. we have to be mindful of is we can create this network center, but then you have 60% of people getting there. And when I look at like our, our challenges in the United States of geography, and, and so often people don't get to the centers early enough. And that I think, and I don't know that we have an easy answer for that, yeah. but I think kind of looking at people who have set up networks and where there's a gap in actually getting people there is something that we will in time should kind of be mindful of and try to address as well going forward because we can build it, but will they, will patients get there? Yeah. And go ahead. And, and one, one thing to add to this, um, it's also important that we pay attention to, let's say, how can we enter the network? Before that, you need to have a kind of diagnosis or, or um, a suspicion of this could be a sarcoma. Yeah. So the entrance point is also something that needs development. Right, ex exactly, and I think that kind of gets to um, our, our, the presentation yesterday of, of Dr. Jacobs of, of talking about how do we make people aware of even at the first inkling and, and getting people to, to the place. Estelle, you kindly have been waiting with your okay, hand but raised. Can I ask, oh, Caroline, uh, please. answer your question maybe? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't give you a chance to. I'm so sorry, Caroline, please. <laughs> okay, um, there are two things we have in mind and one is when the networks around the centers are in place, you get a much better uh, uh, coordination and we expect the diagnosis to be quicker because if it's easier to discuss patients, it's easier to get a diagnosis. And you don't want the, the knowledge about sarcoma to be only in the centers of expertise. You want to have it uh, in, in, in the whole network because of the fact that uh, they, they see the, the patients first before they get into the, the expert centers. So sharing of knowledge and getting the earliest possible a diagnosis is key. And that's one of the, the selling points, uh, to call it that, uh, for the network. Um, so that's one. And we strongly feel that the traffic light is a very simple um tool not only for the hospitals but also for the patients the the the, the gps um to see if there's some kind of um well just to to make clear where a patient should belong uh, if there's any suspicion of any type of uh, of sarcoma so i think may being aware, being made aware of the fact how important the, um, the expertise centers are, 
through such a very simple tool can only be a positive development. Yeah, I, I think that that awareness. So that kind of brings in that piece of of awareness and where that leverages into the whole um, process of getting people to centers of excellence. Th yeah. Thank you. That's great. Can I just add something? Please. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that we are also facing these uh, issues in France because there is no, there is absolutely no problem of uh, communication between the uh, reference and excellence centers. But the problem um, is bigger uh, regarding uh, the centers who are not involved in directly involved in the network, and it uh, clearly the transfer of patients from. Uh, non-specialized centers to centers of reference can be a big issue simply because we have to remember that uh, patients uh, also represent money for the centers. And uh, some of uh, uh, the non-expert uh, centers uh, do not want to uh, leave their patients because when the patient leave, you also lose money. And this is clearly uh, a political and an economical issue uh, which has a, a deleterious impact on the management of uh, rare cancer patients. Estelle, I can echo that from the perspective of the United States. That's a problem as well. If they refer their patients, they lose that revenue. And that, you know, so there is a negative uh, financial, you know, disincentive, if you will, to refer your patient. And that, I think, is an important thing that we need to kind of make sure that we're addressing. I don't know that we can solve it, but being cognizant of it and being aware to figure out how the, to call it out, to recognize that that's a factor. Thank you, Estelle. Annika? Yeah. I, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, within the whole network, as we see it in the Netherlands, so the expert centers and the networks around it, um, we also want to uh, divide the ultra-rare sarcomas, like the um, uh, the publication of Sylvia Stacchiotti last year, who um, well basically made a list of all the ultra rare sarcomas, um, and we want to divide them between the centers of excellence, and not based on okay you don't have anything here you get it, but based on the experience and the knowledge in those centers. So even if you are an expert center for sarcoma, so we have bone sarcoma centers and we have soft tissue sarcoma centers, but even then. We want to um, uh, see where the ultra rare sarcomas are are supposed to be. Um, so that's also it, sometimes it's it's a decision you want to make, and um, we're in the in the process of making those decisions. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it is a, it is a challenge. Um, Annika, I'm gonna turn to you. Yes, uh, uh, this is Annika from Finland. So as Estelle mentioned, uh, the kind of the ownership of the cases, uh, because they are interested, interesting cases. And uh, if you think Finland is sparsely populated of 5 million people in a country of 1200 kilometers, and we're still not having a one single sarcoma center, centralization is not working. Uh, interested cases are kind of kept in the countryside hospitals and it's really, really sad. But it's also that the, uh, if I, for example, the case of my husband, he tried to get to the trial in France, but he couldn't get to the trial in France because he was not French. So, so that's also a case that if we think that now we are assigning ourselves as a global association, we should make uh, work to um, remove the barriers to kind of be able to, uh, that the patients can get the treatment even out of their national networks, because the national networks may be two people who are not communicating abroad, for example. So uh, we have to remember that there are countries like Finland and Estonia that may be uh, and even in like outside of Europe, that we need to build the networks not only nationally, but but keep on like making the communication easy and 
somehow make the patients ha like give the patients opportunity to get the clinical trials, for example, out of their own country. Mm. Yeah, I think that that does uniquely position Spain to to work across the spectrum. You know that there are countries that don't have any networks to more advanced you know situations. What can we learn? How do we help each other? How do we help bring that? And then you raise such an important point of access to clinical trials, and many times it's regulatory barriers. I mean, we have tried, I, I, you know, wearing my hat in, in SARC, it, it getting trials activated in the EU is, it was, is sometimes just so challenging. It was almost easier to say, let's run parallel studies with, the, with it written in that you will compare the data at the end because you cannot actually overcome some, but, but there are ways to do it. So creatively working together and having the conversation is, is very, very critical. Can I also, oh, sorry. Oh. I'll go ahead, uh, Estelle, and then, oh. then we'll go back to you. Uh, I just wanted to say that in France, we have uh, 22 uh, regional sarcoma centers of reference. And the problem is that uh, when you live in a region where there is uh, a, cent a sarcoma centers of reference, uh, the social security will not cover your expense to go to another sarcoma center in another region simply because you already have expertise uh, uh, near where you live. And this is clearly a big issue uh, regarding access to clinical trials <clears throat> because as you know, all the regional centers do not have the same clinical trials. So sometimes uh, some patients are facing big difficulties to uh, uh, reach medical trials simply because the health insurance uh, is not uh, willing to cover this expense considering that you already have expertise near where you live. Uh, so so we, we can also face this kind of issue at the national level. <laughs> That, and that's a pity because uh, clearly uh, patients are not equal uh, despite uh, the big expertise uh, that we have on the national level. No, and, and, and this is an important issue that I think needs to be factored in as we talk about um, solutions. So I think it, it's as much kind of getting together a list of what are the challenges, obstacles, and really um, neg have negative impact on outcome for people if they just can't get to where the best care is. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, Alberto Martinez from Fundación Maripán Jiménez Casado de Spain. Uh, we got seven uh, specialized centers in Spain, but we got 17 uh, territorials, different territorials, which means that there are a lot of that have nothing. And also they are concentrated, for example, in the Catalonia, we got three, in the area of Madrid, we got two, and in Andalusia, we got one, but there are a lot plenty of spaces without any, any center. But uh, my question was just to raise another point. What about since the sarcoma appears until the sarcoma is discovered? This is a long way and normally it takes a lot of time because uh, the people who are the doctor, they have no any knowledge and they are not uh, aware of what sarcoma is they never work with this type of sarcoma. It's a travel that for me is full of wrong decision and mistakes with no return. And the people when arrives to the specialized center is because there is a sarcoma is already in or there is, a, there is a suspicion that there is a sarcoma. But what about before? I think that we need to do as a whole as a, a community of the sarcoma, a whole worldwide campaign to, uh, to show the people and to call the attention of the people who could work with sarcoma at the beginning. Because as soon as the, 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 the sarcoma is discovered, no appears, it is discovered, we start to work with a specialized center, with people, but meanwhile, the sarcoma doesn't exist. But assist. Yeah, that that is a challenge. I think that's part. Maybe, of, oh, please, Marcus. Maybe okay. just just answer to this. Um, uh, you have seen our presentation about the the objectives, the strategic objectives, and the last strategic objectives is on sarcoma awareness, and we discussed this. It doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to put all the energy and time that the whole 
world should learn what a sarcoma is. We will never get there because we don't have the financial power. We don't have the resources to do this. We need to do some smart awareness issues and we can discuss this on an international level, but it needs to be carried out on a national level. What are the core audience? And yesterday we asked uh, Jens Jakob about the, the, the golf ball, what could be a core audience? And he mentioned his surgical colleagues who have no idea what a sarcoma is more or less. It could be one of the target groups. And then you need to do some special campaigning with the right target groups and the right messages to move into the medical community to send patients earlier to sarcoma centers. Because as I mentioned before, we don't have res any resources um, as a network, but also as a community uh, to, to, to put all the money into uh, making understandable what a sarcoma is. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. Should be possible at least to have a sort of uh, cartoon or a sort of documentary or a spot, which is only images and then we translate in every nation that spot. That's, that's already existing. Uh, Estelle has done, I'm just covering, Estelle has done a very, very good awareness uh, videos, yes. uh, three awareness videos, and I think it hasn't already started in France. I think you are close to start. Yep. And we also have had a conversation with Estelle whether we could use these videos for maybe for Spain, but also for the different nations, so that we can easily take the work from France, the, the video work, and then change the, the, the wording and change the speakers to the different nations. We already have had a discussion some months ago and we are, we are on the way. But uh, for example, we did some work, uh, we started another international network around about uh, 12 years ago, IKCC, the International Kidney Cancer Coalition. And um, I was a consultant to the network and we built up the network over the last many years. And fortunately, the kidney cancer community, they has a lot of money also from pharma industry to do some of these campaigning. And they spend every year $120,000, $120,000 to do an international awareness campaign. So they are creating international messages and tools and toolkits and all these issues but it depends on the country whether the the, the organization in the country is using these tools and is, is is using this and rolling out this within the country and whether the organization also for example has contacts to the media and something like this because you can create this on an international level but we don't have the power as an international network to move into the different countries. That's not possible. But we can create, could create something like a toolkit for a specific question or videos. We can share this. But at the end of the day, it, it depends on the activity within the different countries, whether these materials are used in the country or not. I think that's, that's the major issue. We can do a lot. As an, as an organization, but it depends on the member organizations in Italy, England, Netherlands, India, whether they want to use the material and really uh, use the material on a level, on, an, on a national level. Okay, should be possible to have this as a goal by the end of the year. Thanks. And I think that awareness, I, I think what we're identifying is awareness is a key part of this whole spectrum of centers of excellence. You've got to make, and, and trying to figure out where that is um, and how much financially can be spent on it. Who's the, that was why I asked the yeah. question yesterday because we've been struggling with that in the United States, wanting to do, for example, the golf ball campaign of how we thought that would be a clever way to raise awareness, but who are the right people? Yeah, and, and maybe to add this, what does awareness mean as an organization? I am doing some awareness maybe for my organization to raise money for my organization. That is one question, what, what means awareness? Or are we interested in changing situations by doing awareness with a specific message uh, in, in, a, in a specific target group? And just looking back to our um, AGM, when I presented this, this organizational chart of Sarcoma Patients Euronet, we will have in the future working groups and remember there is one spot was open for a task force for sarcoma awareness so we will start this year 
a, a task force and we will need to have volunteers from the community who really want to work with us in this task force to drive this awareness piece forward. We can't do everything from the board, that's not possible. So we need people who really collaborate on certain issues and drive certain issues forward. And, and Marcus, I think you make a really key point of, in the context of the discussion of excellence, how do you, um, define awareness what are the key messages it's driving people early to the center of excellence so how do we change awareness to do that uh yeah just adding into what marcus mentioned about the ikcc awareness you know uh we have been a part of uh, ikcc and you know they have done so much of uh, uh, translations into the hindi uh, materials that i mean they have sent us the material and we have got it translated for our audience back home in hindi because the regional language and uh, we have made it a point of getting it onto our own social medias promoting that particular matter and also trying to uh, you know kind of do some webinars or you know like collectively speak to doctors who are treating uh, kidney cancers and getting people patients who are with us to uh, kind of you know jointly know about this whole event uh, also recently where uh, you know they had this whole uh, uh, session where they had a caregiver from india as part of their panel and you know what are the challenges and how have they managed and everything so i guess it really helps when as an organization as a local organization when we take part and how much do we do because we know the pulse of our population so it is very easy for the local organizations to kind of get the matter, get it translated, and whatever helps us, take it up and do it. Similarly, um, I think many of you all were speaking about, you know, having a center of excellence and how do you reach. So uh, we, uh, because of COVID, you know, we did have this online platform where people could put in their reports and, you know, there are, there are a team of doctors who look into the uh, reports, everything. And uh, Tata Memorial Hospital is one of Asia's biggest cancer hospital. So it is a challenge, you know, because people travel across India, people come from Bangladesh, from Nepal to the uh, treating center, even from Africa. Uh, so it becomes like a challenge because naturally accommodation is not very easy, uh, then uh, it's expensive. And uh, so when you have these online portals where patients can put up their reports, there is a certain fee for private patients, uh, but there are no fees for patients who cannot afford. So they, they made that uh, available during the COVID times and it has really helped because we have kind of uh, not encouraged patients to travel across and you know kind of to uh, explain them about going on the portal and putting in their rep reports everything. So it has really helped and uh, the reports has put in there and within a week or so, uh, you know, the doctors, uh, you know, give their whole uh, diagnosis or whatever that can be done. And if needed, the doctors from the team of those online experts connect to the regional cancer centers and explain. And if, if the whole protocol is the same, the treatment pr process is the same, they can do it in their own hometown rather than traveling across. So that's been done. And, and I think that's another important thing that we can leverage is what we've learned from COVID. I think that before COVID, we talked so much how people don't have access to uh, resources online, and this has just exploded in the, in the face of, of COVID. And so how do we factor that in to help create some of these networks and overcome geographic barriers, as you're describing, has, has happened. And uh, yes, teleconsultation, telemedicine, everything was there. It was not that something COVID has invented. So it was there, but I think COVID has helped us to leverage that to an extent where we could exploit it yes. in a terms where it will benefit us. And uh, I think, you know, there, I, uh, there is a uh, telemedicine center which has come up, uh, Digi Swastya in India which is doing extremely well. It is in the rural parts of India. It, can, it has a panel of doctors. It connects patients. They have a center where the patients from the rural part can come to their center. Uh, they have a video conference with the doctor. The consultations are done online. And if there is anything, then the, the nearest regional cancer center they are connected to. So it's not like, you know, it's, uh, it, it cannot be done, but it was only the thing that something had to be pushed into yeah. for us to do. <laughs> so it, it has been existing, maybe a sleeping partner, but then now it has been like a full fledged, uh, you know, portal, which we are uh, ready to, uh, I mean, we are comfortable with. Right. And I think, I think it forced people who are very skeptical about it 
they had really no choice. And now it's like, whoa, this really is, is quite good. But you raise an excellent point that we need to continue on with that. Just one thing regarding what uh, uh, Marcus says. I understand, I understand that every weakness can be converted in a strength. It's real that it's a weakness that uh, we got a lot of countries and depend of different countries. But also we got the experience of what countries had already done and if they had been successful, what they have done and we try to imitate to get all the things that could be uh, uh, sufficient or could be served to our, uh, to our countries. And that I think is going to be the strength that SPAN can provide that, bring this together, recognizing again that some people are starting out where there's no reference centers at all or people aren't working together. How do we help them to, how do we learn from the people who have, who have really established it quite well? Estelle, did you have your hand up? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, I, I just wanted to um, uh, say that I agreed with Marcus that uh, awareness could have different faces. And uh, regarding the three video spots we have developed for the national organization, of course, we'll be glad to share it with Penn and maybe with other countries uh, uh, which would be interested by these videos, um, because we uh, made the choice to focus on what happens before diagnosis, because uh, uh, the, one of the major issues for sarcoma patients is to understand the first uh, symptoms uh, that should uh, lead them to uh, uh, meet uh, a doctor. So uh, we will be glad to, to share these videos with anyone who will be interested in it when, once they'll be launched. That, that's wonderful. So I think that is also a spirit of of span is this sharing, right? Don't start with a blank piece of paper, right? I mean, we can all kind of get a, a step up and move, maybe move more quickly uh, by working working together. Um, I, I wonder if at this point it might be good to maybe talk a little bit about the experience in Germany. I know there are um, a few slides, Marcus, that we yeah, can maybe but, bring. But, uh, I, I really enjoyed the whole discussion. So if there are any other contributions to the discussions, would be would be very nice. So I. I'm happy to present the slides, but I, I also love this interactive discussion. Yep. So that, that's up to you, really, whether, whether you have, uh, maybe you want to share your experience. Uh, maybe we can ask our friends here in Switzerland, yes, what is your experience regarding, regarding the uh, sarcoma centers? <laughs> I think we, I ha we have not a good uh, experience. We don't actually, we ch just one certified CHIST center just opened in Bern. And that was certified by the Deutsche Krebsgesellschaft. And as I know, a group has set up uh, seven sarcoma centers in Switzerland. But I don't think that they are really sarcoma centers. They're, they are oncologists or perhaps uh, surgeons who are experienced. And I know that all those oncologists and chosen, they, they work together with, with the German colleagues or with the French colleagues. But I, would, I wouldn't say that we have seven sarcoma centers. <laughs> but as Switzerland is so small, we know the doctors. You, you see, and the doctors know each other. And all those doctors, they, they go to the same conferences. So if I have a case or if I know somebody, then I, I, I just uh, call this doctor or write him a mail and ask him and then they work together as colleagues. But I wouldn't say that we have a, a real sarcoma center. We have some, some hospitals who say we have a chist. We are experienced in chist. And so it's less of a formal network. And the, do you think that works well then? Do, I mean, I think that's an excellent point. Does, you know, if, if it's working well with a more informal because of the close proximity and the connection and from a, that the patients feel like I have access and I get good care and there's not delay in diagnosis and such. And I think that's, and in this respect, I think that our group is very strong because if patients come to, to us and I know the doctors, so it, it's much easier to get for the patients an appointment. Yeah. Or to, wow. It, I mean, if I if I write to to one of the doctors, I have a new member. 
it's this and this case, can you give a second opinion? It goes faster, mm -hmm. right? So I, I don't think that we have really centers of excellence. As I said, only one really now certified GIST uh, center. And as I know that they want to become also a sarcoma center. Maybe we should also have in mind, and I, I think someone said this a few minutes ago, it's not about structures and clinics. A sarcoma center is not a wall, it's not a building, it's about people. So it's always about committed people, people who are experienced, who have passion to drive sarcoma centers forward. We have, for, for example, historically, we have had one sarcoma center in Germany, and when two people left this sarcoma center there is no any longer a sarcoma center it's down because the people left and so the question is what is a center must a center be always be in one hospital or maybe can two or three hospitals are working together where you have an experienced pathologist where you have an experienced surgeon and maybe an experienced oncologist this is a model for example in germany for one of the sarcoma centers in frankfurt they work across three different hospitals it needs logistics it needs organizational issues but it works or our colleagues in austria i know from from some discussions with our colleagues in austria they are working close with the hospital in romania that means some of the experts are going, I think, every once a month, they go to Romania to the hospital, and then they work with the Romanian experts uh, to treat patients in a, in a, let's call it a virtual, more virtual sarcoma unit. So the question is always, what is a center? Uh, is it more a center? Is it a network or whatever? As is it at the end of the day, there must be some experience and some expertise. However, the expertise or the experience is distributed. Maybe there is a chance in the future to establish one sarcoma center, maybe for two or three different countries, smaller countries. We don't know, but there are a lot of different models out there. So the question is always, where is the solution? Solution and who are the drivers? It always needs drivers. To, to drive these things forward at the end of the day. And that's so, so I, I guess that we keep thinking, in my mind, I keep thinking that bricks and mortar and, and, and a lot of what we've talked about is it's the people, it's the expertise that drives it, not the building or where the building is located, but it's the, the knowledge um, and the skill of the medical and surgical and radiation and all of the team working together. And they might not all live in the same, same building. So yeah, that's that's excellent. Caroline? Yeah, um, I, I don't believe in a network as an, as an expert uh, center. We have similar um, situations here in the Netherlands. We have uh, six soft tissue sarcoma centers and uh, one of them is in a network. So uh, various hospitals working together as an expert center. In my opinion, if the organization is right, um, you should have it in one hospital and not shared in, in, in several hospitals. Because if an hospital is dedicated to sarcoma care, they need to get the people in, in house and not share them over several uh, hospitals. And of course, it's possible to organize such thing, but then it becomes a network and not an expert center. So I think the expert center should always be the center of a network and should be the center where uh, most of the sarcomas are being treated and not one or two. We have one network who uh, has one hospital for GIST, another one for the soft tissues. And I, I think you, you, you yeah, it, it's not the best solution. Um, if, if they want to be a dedicated center, they should be dedicated and get the people. And maybe it's also good that we share uh, the Dutch um, uh, requirements for becoming an expert center with you guys. I can translate them and send them over. So you see what kind of, um, well, demands are given to the, to the expert center for rare uh, diseases. And maybe you can use them. No, that, that's an excellent point. I think putting on my hat as a uh, clinician, 
uh, as a nurse practitioner working in sarcoma, I think that while we talk about the diagnosis and laying out the treatment plan, the delivery of the treatment plan is very important. Some of these therapies, this came up yesterday with uh, Dr. Reichert in the liposarcoma section of maybe there are some treatments that should be licensed only to expert centers to deliver because, you know, quite frankly, giving adromycin iphosphamide is not, you know, requires a fair amount of medical management. And, you know, I would be seeing those patients several times as they're in the infusion center every day. You need to assess them and you need to understand how to deliver those therapies. That's not an easy therapy that any chemotherapy center can deliver. You really need to have the not only expert in the diagnosis and laying out the treatment plan, but the delivery of the treatment plan. So that is something um, another layer, I think, of, of certification, if you will. I know we're talking, I mean, I feel like it's a big level of just even getting people to the center and getting the right diagnosis. Now this is putting refinement on it of saying, are they delivering the treatment? Do they have the capabilities within that center to deliver the treatment? Because it's not quite so simple. And we, we, Caroline, I appreciate you bringing that up so that we keep that also in, in mind. Marcus? In, maybe including one of the issues is, we know that in sarcomas, we have some very specialized procedures, for example, hypothemia or ILP or pro proton beam technology, or we will see in the future gene cell therapy. And this will be not possible to have these proce procedures at each sarcoma center. That's not possible. So the sarcoma centers need to work together to send patients to the different locations so that they get the best treatment. Because we made the experience with one of the centers, we have had a really a nasty discussion with one of the centers because there was a patient day and then they presented two cases. And I asked the question whether these two cases shouldn't have get ILP. This is a specific procedure. And then the doctor or the expert said, yes, we discussed this. It would have been a nice uh, option for the patient, but we don't have it here. So we, we, we did another option. And I think that's not the right way. Uh, and that's why we need on one side the centers, but we also need the collaboration among centers so that if a specific procedure is not available in a specific center, so that the, the center is willing to send the patient maybe to another center. That, that, is, that, that, is, that is an excellent point. And how do we do that? I think that ends up being somewhat also that money issue, if you will, right? So they kept the patient to do the treatment versus necessarily, you know, that could be a factor. Yes, and in addition to that, uh, kind of being able to do that abroad, because for example, in Finland, we don't have proton beam, beams at all. The closest ones are in, in Sweden and in Germany, and I only know kind of a handful of sarcoma patients in Finland who have been having protons usually in Germany. So it's like, it's, it's possible, but it's done too rarely. It's not uh, really an option. Um, maybe some one doctor is sending some of his patients, but it's, yeah. That, I think that's an important, and I think it's complex, right, across, um, across country lines, how do, we, how do we do some of that? I, I, I wanna go back to Mark, Marcus's question of asking, is there anybody else here in the room that has a, um, wants to share, like what happens in their country that we can kind of factor this in and make sure that we're, we're understanding and really tapping into each and every one of you who are participating today. Um, anything to share about how? so that everybody online can hear you, Vandana. Thank you. I want to add on that, you know, there are uh, certain factors which we need to take into consideration while we are talking about the specialized form of treatment. One is the cost of it, because um, like, you know, Marcus mentioned about proton therapy. We have a center for proton therapy, but the cost is prohibitive. So even if the patient needs to have it, the doctors may not recommend because looking at the patient status, it may not be possible. And it's not like an insurance that will pay for it or something like that. So that becomes a hindrance and sometimes the treatment gets compromised because of that. And the second thing is that, you know, um, there may not be um, specialized centers for treatment because of many reasons. And one of them being that, you know, first you want to have enough centers for the treatment of all cancers. 
So like in Tata Memorial Hospital, uh, which Jyoti mentioned, we have a, a disease oh. management group, which means each particular disease is being managed by that particular group. And they, it is as good as being a center of excellence, but it's not like dedicated. I mean, it's that uh, it's not a different building, so to say. It's all being done in the same hospital. And I think that's another thing that we can look into, that if there's a center which has specialized people who can take care of things, then it can be done in the same thing instead of having a separate uh, you know, entity of calling it a center for excellence. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cost part because of the insurance and other things. So those two things I wanted to talk about. No, absolutely. Those are really important points that we have to continue to factor. And I'm trying to capture this. I don't know if I'll be able to summarize it at the end of our two hours, but I promise I will try to bring it together. I think every country is different, and the size of the countries also uh, are just uh, focusing how that distribution or network has to be done. But for example, there is another condition, there is another point that condition totally the, the, the structure, is the political. The po the, the, in, in Spain, for example, we got 70 different uh, territories or what we call communities. That 17, each one has has their, their proper government. All of them wants to have a, a, a central reference, Mr. Coma. All of them, as the same manner, they, all of them wants to have a biggest airport, a biggest uh, stadium, a biggest everywhere. And this is political. And the political decision takes, or long more than four years five years depend on the rotation or the election of six country and all depend on that and then i think that it's very difficult to 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 define one uh, structure for everything we must be uh, put in the context of each country that's good to continue to remind us of that because i think it's not it's not looking for one size fits all, right? It's going to be a spectrum and people are going to need to, if we set some core principles, then how does it actually get implemented in each different country and different region is really gonna be based on financial uh, cost, access, politics, things of that nature. And, and just kind of keeping a list of what those things are and each individual, that's it's as Marcus said, it's gonna take a group. It's not gonna be one person saying, here's the here are the rules. We started uh, 30 years ago with a Scandinavian sarcoma group. I think that has been the first um, let's think where 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 experts started together on a on a on a national level. And we have seen this during the last years in more and more countries. Then it came up uh, the French sarcoma group, the Italian sarcoma group, the British sarcoma group. So more and more expert networks came up. And it has always to do how active are these networks, but also how much political <coughs> influence do they have? And we know from France with Jean-Yves that he has a lot of political influence and a lot of power and also other people within the community. I think that's one of the driver to have people organized together in a specific country, driving the agenda forward. Uh, and also the collaboration between the patient organization or the patient network and the experts. This could be extremely powerful. And we have seen this in France, in UK, in Germany, and different other countries where you can really move the agenda forward. And you just mentioned Spain. I can remember, I think it was around about maybe 15 years ago, there was rarely had been any activities in Spain. And then the, 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 the group came up, I think, what is the name, Geish? Or what, what is the, the Spanish name of the, of the case? Oh, I can't explain that, that, that okay. But then, then uh, people like uh, Martin Broto and different other people, they, they now 
are the drivers behind this. They are moving forward. And then also patient activities came up. It takes sometimes 10, 15 years, but it, it, you can achieve a lot in driving the agenda forward. But it needs always committed people who are really try to tr drive things forward and being also, as we know, politically involved. Because without political decisions and political influence, a lot of things will not happen at the, at the end. Can I add something? I don't hear anything. Please go ahead, Esther. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to um, add something about the choice of uh, the pharmaceutical industry also. Because, uh, as you know, when uh, new clinical trials open, they uh, often, uh, let's say, always open in the main centers of reference, which is in France, Paris, Lyon, and Bordeaux. And uh, the regional centers also have a lot of difficulties to have new uh, openings of clinical trials. And this is clearly um, also um, a big issue for patients because, as you know, uh, if you want to have uh, new clinical trials in your center, you have to have patients. So if you send your patients to other bigger centers, well, you also lose sarcoma patients, which also decrease the interest of the pharma companies to come and uh, propose new cl clinical trial uh, in your centers. So this is also um, uh, a, a very critical point for the regional centers because it's more and more difficult for uh, patients living uh, outside Paris, uh, Lyon and Bordeaux to have access to innovation because innovation is in the big cities and as I said uh, previously, it is sometimes um, uh, forbidden by, uh, uh, let's say, sometimes uh, the health insurance refuse to uh, reimburse the uh, travel expenses for these patients who should need to go uh, somewhere. And uh, also because uh, these uh, small centers refuse to uh, send their patients uh, to these trials because uh, it means that they also lose patients and probably uh, there is to have um, less and less clinical trials open in their centers. I can't hear anything. Oh, hello, there we go. Um, I, I appreciate you bringing back the point of uh, clinical trials and it, within this context of discussion of centers of excellence because I think we recognize the only way we change standard of care and change and get new things forward is through the path of clinical trials. And I might also come and I see that in, in the United States, the FDA was also quite tight on regulating um, that you had to have certain things done only at one center. And I think COVID has now opened the door that maybe some of that will be changing a bit in, in the United States to allow um, a combination or collaboration amongst a maybe more regional cent, you know, uh, hospital seeing a patient with the center of excellence where the patients don't have to always travel back and forth. But this whole issue of insurance, and I, I think there are data to support that. Uh, I know there's in the literature that says sometimes cancer care is best delivered on a clinical trial. So having access to that for patients is very, is very important and needs to be sit, considered in the context of this discussion of centers and uh, networks of excellent care for patients. Any Wait, wait, do we need to have a mic? Okay. Yesterday, I was in one of the rooms of the downstairs. Can I, re I can't remember now the, the presentation was on, in Ewin, the first one on life. I can't remember now who, who, who done. But the, the thing is that uh, the speaker present 10 cases. And one of them was one in, in which Spain uh, present to this uh, trial five, five, five persons, five patients. And in that, uh, in that uh, uh, table, there were 200, uh, 2018, 2019, 2020, and, and, and I think 21, 2021. And 
in 21, in Spain, there were only two patients in that uh, in trial. And the reason is because the patients that were in, 19, in 2018 and 2019 were from Seville, from one hospital in Seville. And the doctor was moved to another part in Spain. And that patient has disappeared of that uh, uh, trial and the doctor still has no the power to start to send patients to the trial in the new uh, place. That means what you say, that depends a lot of the, of, of, of the commitment of the, of the medical, of the doctor, of the community doctor, I think. I'm hopeful that our, our, our collaboration with uh, Connective Tissue Oncology Society of the global network of experts and us working together, this is such an important topic, as you underscored, Marcus, and you're underscoring as well. We've really got to make sure that they're on board and, and we engage. And Estelle, you give an excellent example of how good partnership with, um, with the uh, clinician and researchers is going to be important as well. So maybe I should yeah, just please. share my presentation, but not um, the current status, more, more the vision. I think that that could be interesting because we have seen so many good uh, or have had a, such a good conversation about current status. Could you just uh, start it? Okay, so I, I briefly um, will mention the first part. So one of our issue in Germany is that we still have insufficient data about the cases of sarcomas. It so sounds ridiculous, but we always think about that there are five, 6,000 sarcomas, but we know, don't know what exactly the numbers of subtypes and something like this, because this is a long history in Germany, because our cancer registries are regional. We don't have a national cancer registry. We have regional, 16 regional cancer centers, and this makes the, the, the situation so problematic. So they have done a lousy job in the history, and now things changing, fortunately, because more and more people are active in this. And we also see still lost time with incorrect diagnosis, often uh, too much time ago, uh, or treatment according to the guidelines. So, because a lot of doctors still treat sarcoma patients without knowing what they are doing because uh, of their ego or because they get money for this or something like this. So I think there, there are still problems, but I think we made, we made a lot of progress during the last years. Many patients, and this is another problem, are still too doctor believing, not knowing that sarcoma should be treated in specialized centers. That's still a case. I have seen this with my own parents when it comes to heart diseases. They think that they have to find an expert or a general practitioner around, around their house or something like this, not knowing that maybe an expert center is 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers away. So it's, it's something like, to, to think about this is a rare cancer and you really need an expert who is taking care of this, uh, this, this disease. The term sarcoma center is not protected, it's not transparent. Every hospital can say tomorrow I'm a sarcoma center. So it's not really transparent for many patients and not every that is called a center is a real center. So you have a label of a sarcoma center. We have in the meantime certified sarcoma centers in Germany and believe me, there are some centers I would never send a GIST patient to this center or maybe never send a patient with a gynecology sarcoma to this center because they don't have the experience. They are a certified sarcoma center, but that means not that they have the expertise for all the hundred uh, sarcoma subtypes. That's not possible. So you have to be more selective. And we fought now for more than 10 years for sarcoma or sarcoma centers on for, for a certification process in Germany. And when I say we, means always experts and patients together. We did this job now for the last 10 years. And in Germany, the certification process means it's done by the Deutsche Krebsgesellschaft, but also with an external auditor, with an external auditing company, they are doing this certification process. And they had a lot to do, a lot, big business. This is also big business, this certification process, by doing this during the last years for the common cancer. So we have 
mass of breast cancer centers and colon cancers and all these issues. And then now they fortunately made a decision to move also in the field of rare cancers. And this was the right time then to set up the certification process of uh, the sarcoma centers. So we have a weak certification process. That means we have criteria of being a sarcoma center. And believe me, th there was a lot of negotiation between doctors, political negotiations, how high or how low the bar should be to become a sarcoma center. It was like an oriental market by just discussing about what are the criteria of becoming a sarcoma center. So, and this is the main problem. Certification does not mean automatically quality. Certification means you are ticking the box, you are fulfilling some criteria, you have the processes in place and a lot of different other things, but it does not mean that there is really quality. And unfortunately, patients think if you have a certified sarcoma center, this is about quality. It's not the case because you need to have other indicators. You need to come up with quality indicators on a lot of different other issues that are important. So suddenly, we see centers coming up. We never have had in mind that this is a sarcoma center. We never have them on the agenda. And suddenly, they are now becoming a sarcoma center because they are fulfilling criteria. That's really a strange issue. And we have to work on this process. And what I personally think, what a system error is, that patient advocates are not members of the audited, audited teams. We need to come into this process that also patient advocates become part of the auditing. There are not so many auditings per year for sarcoma centers, maybe three, four, five uh, audit, audits per year. And there could be, uh, um, patient advocates could be part of the process. So we will, we will advocate for this. These are the so-called sarcoma centers in the moment, 19 in Germany. Many of them, there are sarcomas for soft tissues. So currently we are talking about soft tissues. There will be another certification process. This is the current thinking about to do this also for bone cancers. But currently it's mainly driven in soft tissues they are also covering bone, but they are not really, that means not automatically that they have a whole experience or a deep experience also in bone cancer. This might be another process in the future. I think an important factor for a solution in our future, and this is discussed with our medical experts, as I mentioned before, three years ago, we founded this new organization, the Deutsche Sarkom Stiftung. And the Deutsche Sarkom Stiftung means Experts like Peter uh, Reichert, you have seen him yesterday, or Peter Hohenberger, Jens Jakob, and a lot of different experts. We are working together in one organization. So this is not any or longer just a pure patient organization. This is an organization where experts and patients are working under one umbrella to change the things and drive things forward. That's, that's, that's our new credo after three years. And what we now need to do Fortunately, we already have established national guidelines. This is not very easy. Some years ago, we focused only on the ESMO guidelines. In the meantime, we established national guidelines for sarcomas, including patient guidelines. This means that the national guidelines are also translated into a patient language. Then we are on our way during the last two, three years to have an increasing presence and influence in health policy. That's also very, very important to be seen as a community and to get more and more influence as a community. We are on our way to optimize the certification process to, for sarcomas. One factor is quality. So what could be quality indicators in the future, not just ticking the box, but also outcome quality but also, what about patient satisfaction? I think this is an important fa factor in the future that we also get the feedback. What are the experiences of the patients and what, are, what is the satisfaction of the patients? Then we have a study group. That's the German Interdisciplinary Sar uh, Sarcoma Study Group. This will be very important in the future to run more clinical trials. And, and this will be very close linked. So we are just bringing this organization closer to the Deutsche Sarkom Stiftung, that this will be more or less 
a sister organization of the Deutsche Sarkom Stiftung, we also think about how can we do a much better job in sarcoma registries because this is another important topic. And I'm always impressed by the example of um, France when I hear from Estelle that they have been able to bring 20,000 patients in a sarcoma registry. That's unbelievable a piece of work. This is really great. And we are far away from this, but as you know, the data is the future. We need to build up a database in a sarcoma registry to do it. What we need to do, we need to build up a strong, qualified and active network of sarcoma centers, not just being a sarcoma center. These centers need to start a collaboration. We as Deutsche Sarcom Stiftung, we will create contracts, collaboration contracts with the sarcoma center so that we really move forward in a, in a, in a common way. We need common working groups and projects that are tackling the challenges and finding solutions. And we already started to have five working groups within the Deutsche Sarkom Stiftung. We need to focus more on patient needs, experience and satisfaction. This will be an important criteria. And also sarcoma awareness, as we just mentioned, in a very targeted way and in specific uh, campaigns. And this needs to be done together, patients and experts, as I mentioned before, we need to work very close together. And in our case, we made a decision to do this in one organization uh, together. This is the future, and this is our vision for the future. What we need for our understanding, we need to do. We need to have a national qualitative sarcoma network. And that's what France has done. And we have heard a lot from Estelle. 10 years ago to start such a qualitative network, but we also try to move a long step ahead. That's, that's our vision that combines the treatment quality, but also combines research and data so that all sarcoma patients have early access to a qualified and digitalized. This is important. So we are not talking about just only a, a, a network of centers. It's about digitalization and we will talk I don't know maybe in a half an hour more about the topic of digitalization with access to qualified real sarcoma centers that means in the future patients are treated in sarcoma centers or are treated in hospitals who are linked to a sarcoma center that's that's the future we, you can't treat all patients in sarcoma pa centers it will be not possible from a ca capacity but you can build up a network of excellence where you work together. We also need to think about what, is, what are the opportunities of modern precision personalized sarcoma therapy. Because we all know we have a long tradition in doing chemotherapy, but chemotherapy hopefully is not the future. So we need to have find more innovative treatments, more per personalized therapy. And we also need collaborative research structures in clinical trial data and tissue. That was also mentioned by Estelle in doing clinical trials together within this network. So that, that's, that's the vision. So in the future, in our vision in the future is that patients will receive information and help and support as early as possible in the moment when they are entering the network or when they are linked to the network, they get support, information and help by the network. We also want to have them an immediate pathological and molecular diagnostics that really will create data within the network. That's very important. And patients will get personalized therapy plans by sarcoma boards and guidelines, but also they can be offered partly even innovative therapies. That means, for example, just take the example of GIST. We know that we have in GIST KIT mutations and PDGF alpha mutations, but we also have a small group of patients, wild type. And we look to these wild type patients, we have a lot of very rare mutations. And in the moment when I have the genetic data from this patient, from a specific patient, Knowing that this patient has a wild type with a BRAF mutation, for example, very exotic, but it's there. Then we can think in a very exotic way within this network how to treat the patient with a BRAF therapy, because there are already BRAF therapies out there. 
So it's about bringing the treatments as early as possible to the patient, but also maybe bring some innovative, sometimes experimental treatments to the patients. And then this is, I think, a very big issue is in the moment, if we have many patients or if we have many, the data of many patients within the network, specifically the genetic data of the patients, we will be able to do something like real, real life uh, research. Because my personal or our personal opinion, and we have had a lot of discussions, in the future, we will be not able to run clinical trials as we have done this in the, in the history. Uh, because every, as you know, every trial needs a lot of efforts, a lot of time, a lot of money and something like this. So we need to come to smoother and faster solution by bringing patients in smaller, but more experimental and faster trials. And this will give, if in the moment, if we have such a database, if we have such a, such a database, the research will come to the patient and not the patients have to look for clinical trials. I think that's the way around. So we need to be more visionary and more, uh, more, more active in the future. So I think that's the chance of, on one side, to have a qualitative network working together to treat the patients in the best possible way, but also use this fantastic network for research and bring research faster and really more tailored to the patient because otherwise we will be not able in the future to invest all this money into research. So that, that's a little bit about our vision. It will take us several years, I'm sure. We are on the way to do this. So now we are in the early phase to establish the basic concept. So we have these network, uh, we have the certified centers in place. Now we are on our way to start the collaboration, closer collaboration with these centers, and then moving forward more and more within the next five, six, seven years into such a center. But it needs commitment, it needs engagement, and at the end of the day, it needs money. And that's why we, for example, need an organization like the German uh, Sarcoma Foundation as something like a coordinator and something like a, like a, uh, yes, a coordinator of the network because otherwise it, 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 it will be very hard to drive things forward. Also in, in inclusive, the, the fact where, where should the money come from? That, that's another issue because if one institute is asking for money, that's one issue. But if you have a network coming up by asking for money, a lot of things are possible. And maybe just to end with this, we have just um, established a very uh, successful project in Germany. There was a big call, a reach research call in Germany um, about um, basic research and uh, a lot of competitive um, projects had been uh, gone to this call. And then because we work very close with our expert colleagues together in one of these um, proposals, and the proposal uh, is called Heroes Aya, and this is specifically a project for sarcomas, specifically for young patients and sarcomas. And now we receive funding for the next 15 years, so the final, final amount is not clear, but we are talking about around about 13, 14 million euros for the next five years in doing basic research in this area, but with the support of the patient organization. So we are part of the whole network. We are part of the whole project in driving the things forward. We also developed the project together. We also presented the project together. And this is how things can work. In the moment when you have collaborative structures, when you drive, drive things forward, you can be also successful. So at the end of, I, I, I'm not sure how many, there are some, some uh, statements going on that there had been 15, 16 projects. At the end of the day, there had been two projects left who will be funded by the government for this activity. So things are possible if you really work together and, and, and try, to, uh, try to, to, to drive things forward. And I'm sure we will also come to this qualified um, centers of excellence. And that's why we are also trying to understand better what's going on in the different countries, because this is exactly one of our major issues. We need to get the patients as early as possible into qualified care, into 
qualified expert care, or however you call it, whether you call it a center or a network or whatever, but the main issue is to get the patients as early as possible there. And this is our task for the next months and maybe one and a half years to think about what could be a good strategy, come up with a very good position paper to show what is possible in sarcoma care globally, but also drive things forward to, together with our uh, medical team. Thank you, Marcus. That was wonderful. <laughs> Another excellent example for us to draw upon as we start looking at how we would lay out a roadmap. Are there any questions of, of Marcus on, on what he presented or, or comments? Maybe can, can we switch to the... Because I apologize, I cannot yet see who's online and if anybody is, is anybody, no one's raising their hand at this juncture? Okay. Um, I, I wonder if, you know, um, we're getting about about 10 minutes away from, from end of this session. And I know that uh, Roger was supposed to be here with us today and he had prepared uh, a couple of slides. I don't know, Sorella, are you on the line? No, she's not, okay. Um, and that's fine. I just thought that if she was, we would we would turn to her, um, and and maybe we just take a look at those um, slides that kind of talk a little bit about the experience that Roger has had. So I apologize. Here I have you. I'm flipping you back and forth. If we can go uh, back to the slide deck where actually where Marcus, it's in my slide deck. I mean, she's it's so it's the next one down. Yep. I tried to put them all together so it would be um, easier. Let's see. Here we go. So this is um, uh, England uh, speci specifications for uh, contracting hospital center network to provide services. So um, Roger has provided us a link to this uh, document that has been uh, prepared and dates back from 2019. Um, and it really represents that they've spent like 13 years pulling this together. So we understand these things take time and negotiation and clearly uh, what Estelle and Marcus have described is not something that you know, or, or Caroline, that's just happened overnight, right? Um, and so they've, they've tried to create the idea of a center based on the multidisciplinary team of specialists. And so they put together a guidance document back in 2006. And uh, important to note that Roger was able to be one of the authors. So they, again, have been engaging patients from the very beginning. Um, they've set quality standards from 2015. Um, uh, largely ensuring that patients will have a quality service. Um, again, um, an important stepping point, putting together some clinical guidance. Uh, the British Sarcoma Group uh, has put together guidelines uh, for soft tissue sarcoma. So I see we, some common themes that we see, you know, continuing to come up um, to have guidelines uh, for, for care and understand um, and, and, and disseminate that information across the, across the group. Um, they also have not only guidance for soft tissue sarcoma, but for bone as well. And this kind of followed on. So I think, uh, again, underscoring the whole spectrum of not just one disease, but trying to, to be broad and across, as well as some of the special issues we know that are associated with some of the uh, uh, subtypes, like for GIST, that, that ends up being, can't, doesn't easily get lumped into soft tissue sarcoma. There's some specific um, issues for GIST and for Desmoid. And so um, these guidelines have been published. Um, they initially were refused uh, to be accepted. So I think that also speaks to, I was pointing out back in 2004, in the US we set forth guidelines and they never really got implemented. So yet again, a very, you know, another common, common theme. But but the point is, I think, and I, I'm sure Roger could speak to this so much more eloquently, so I feel a bit uh, uh, at, at um, a disadvantage uh, because he is so well versed in this space. But I think that um, having this background, um, we can recognize that there's yet another example for us to draw upon. Um, he, he also has done a good deal of work across the Scottish Sarcoma Network which he thought uh, he's noting here is possibly the oldest and longest network that was started back in 2004. And it's very different from England. And they have um, uh, five city-based sarcoma centers, some with several hospital plus pediatric 
specialty units, and they really have learned how to work together as a single network. Um, and they meet weekly by video link uh, to discuss challenging cases. Um, and I think this really, um, it made me think when Gerard was making the comment about one voice needs to come to the patient, you need to have these groups of experts having the discussion. If you've ever had the opportunity to sit in on, on, a, on a tumor board, there, it is really um, an excellent exchange of, that's the experts saying, no, I think this, no, I think that. And they're kind of wrangling amongst each other to say, you know, what is going to be the best care for this patient? And so that is a great advantage to the patient that then the outcome of that comes back to the patient saying, we've come together as a consensus and we now have weighed the pros and cons and this is the best therapy um, going forward. Uh, they have surgery and radiation oncology in five hospitals. They've got a special uh, sarcoma surgery group, um, one for, um, you know, head and neck as well, uh, medical oncology expertise. That, and importantly, we keep hearing this theme coming up that all pathology is reviewed um, by a, a specialist. Um, and, and I think that that continues to be a theme. I, I've seen excellent expert pathologists, leading sarcoma pathologists, sometimes even disagree on it. So these are not easy diseases to diagnose. So uh, to get the a second review uh, is, is really critical. And then I think um, they, they, he also recognizes that within these hospitals, they have specialized nurses. So I, to my point of delivery of care, it's not just laying out a plan, but having a team who really understands because if a, if a treatment is not delivered, as ordered in the optimal way, you might not get the optimal benefit. And so um, the main, and then they have a main site for where the clinical trials are. But again, I think geographically, we're looking at a, a different size from, you know, you take Scotland versus like the United States or India, or you look at geographically, some of these things may not be so uh, applicable. But he uh, provides us with an example uh, at the bottom there where he says that a, a patient with a suspected sarcoma living in Orkney Islands would drive or ferry to Inverness for diagnosis. CT MRI scans would be reviewed in the network. The pathology would have the local initial diagnosis, but then it would also have a confirmation from a specialist in the network. And then surgery would be planned in Aberdeen or Glasgow. And then the patient would be flown to the surgical center and post-surgical report would be reviewed within the network. And subsequently any adjuvant uh, radiotherapy would be planned at Inverness. And wow, I mean, talk about coordinated care across um, uh, a network. Um, but again, I think what it also speaks to is that you have to get that first entry point. And I think that's another piece that we need to continue to, you know, is after somebody already said, oh, I think this is a sarcoma. And, and that is such a, I think that many delays are in that area where people think, I don't think it was a sarcoma. So then they don't get access into that, that uh, care. Um, and then, oops, lastly, there, I thought there was like one more slide. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So uh, Roger had, um, and, and I'll forward this to you, he had um, shared a, an excellent publication. Um, oh, there it is. Uh, I can go back. I knew it was there. Um, uh, he had shared this important paper, and I guess I put it more at the beginning of the um, presentation because I, I think that um, this is a nice kind of position paper, if you will, and I, I will share, I have a, a, a PDF copy of it that really speaks to, as we're wrangling with this, um, this subject, that there has been, there's been a fair amount of work, not only within the countries and groups here, but then we see that, that this group of uh, Theria Cinder, who's up in Canada, uh, and Karen Alberton, she is, um, uh, in the Boston area, and then uh, uh, Professor David Thomas is in Australia, but they address this issue of, of the disadvantaged um, uh, patients' care uh, because of disparities in health across different geographical locations. They talk about the issues of geographic isolation, insurance status, racial, ethnic, and other factors. And in this article, they look at how these disparities really affect the care of patients with sarcoma in the United States, Canada, and the Asia Pacific region. So this is a really excellent resource, I think, for us to use kind of as a background uh, of information coupled along with this excellent discussion today. I mean, this, this for me, this session was really excellent to understand a better right from you today in 2022, 
where do we stand in this issue of getting accurate diagnosis, early access to expert care, um, clinical trial access, um, expert proton beam and, and, and the state of the art therapy. And I think that um, as, as I hear from, from SPAN that we wanna see this available to everybody. You know, how do we make sure that this is an international standard? And we recognize this is a big, you know, aud audacious goal. It is, it is big, but, but I think that the timing is right and that we're poised to tackle this. And maybe I would ask you, Marcus, to maybe make uh, kind of a few parting uh, remarks ab about this. No, no, I'm, I'm really, really happy about the whole discussion. I really enjoyed the discussion also to see what's going on really in, in, in the different countries. And really, this is one of our major, and you have seen this also in our objectives, this is one of our strategic object, objectives really to drive this forward because uh, the expertise of, of, of uh, diagnostics and care is really one of the major issues. We really need to improve this. And as I mentioned before, we will put a lot of work in this within the next months, uh, come up with a so kind of a position paper uh, that really can make an Im impact and really can make a difference also together with our medical colleagues. So we will contribute or we involve the medical colleagues also in this process because I know that they are very keen to be involved in, in, in the process. But also what we have done here to do something like I think we call it a little bit something like a mapping. So what's going on in the different countries so that we get really an overview whether in a country is a sarcoma center, is there one single sarcoma center? Are there more sarcoma centers? Is there a network? Are they certified? So I think we need to gather something like a map and then we really can move forward. Um, I think that's, that's, that's what really a fantastic discussion and uh, I, I, I learned also so much from the different areas, so that was really, really cool. Maybe a, a last question, is Estelle still online? If you wanna bring down. Yes, I'm still here. Yeah, I, I just have a very brief uh, question. You mentioned 40 trials in three years that had been covered by the network. Yeah, yes, but it was only in 2013, so uh, probably the figure uh, today is uh, higher. Okay. But, uh, do, do you have an idea how many patients have been involved in these trials roundabout? Uh, in 2013? Yeah. Uh, yes, I can check it quickly. Uh, every, um, he's well prepared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nearly uh, 600 patients. Wow. So I, I, I think they were talking about early phase trials, probably. Oh. Okay, that's cool, thank you. That's, that's terrific. That's well, really good. I will commit to, um, within the next few days, to try to summarize and capture some key points. And then I'd like to circulate it to everybody who participated. And, and you could please add, know that I've tried to listen and write, and so I, I'm sure I have not captured perfectly everything, uh, but I think it's gonna be important to capture some key points from this discussion so that we can use it as a launching point forward. And um, I wanna thank our, our online participants. It was just excellent for, for you to, to be here and share your perspective and be part of the conversation. It was uh, really critical. And we hope that there's a time soon that we're all gonna be able to be together in the, the same room and, and have the conversation. But I think this went extremely well. And I really thank you all. I believe we're gonna take a break now and yeah. then we will reconvene at uh, 11.30, so thank you so much.